Gitco News special coverage of Bitcoin 2023 is brought to you by Coin Payments. Crypto payments made easy. There is a move away from the dollar. What are your thoughts on that? Do you see the de-dollarization trend accelerating to a point where we have a full bifurcation of the global monetary system and the dollar really loses its status as the global reserve currency? And then what would that mean for Bitcoin? I don't think you'll see like a, a an instant state change in any way. Uh, as people lose confidence in the Western banking system, and if they lose confidence in the dollar, then it creates a, uh, it catalyzes them to want to go to uh, either barter, where they're they're directly bartering oil for food or oil for natural gas or 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 commodities for manufactured products, they may consider that. Or they look for other commodity monies and other, other commodity uh, monetary networks. I think in the, uh, in the near term, that creates inefficiency and, and to a certain degree, a bit of chaos. Like right now, the debate of, you know, will Russia take rupees and, and will the Indians trade with the Chinese using CNY? And then who, who do I want to trust and what network do I want to trust? So there's a lot of chaos and a lot of inefficiency and a lot of friction, but it is inevitable. In the extreme, in theory, an Austrian econo economist would say, when the money fails, we're all ripped back to Stone Age barter. So in the extreme case, if there is no money or monetary network trusted by anybody, then you're going to barter and you're just going to barter weapons for food, for commodities, for services. And of course, it's Stone Age barter, but the economy shrinks because barter is obscenely inefficient. I, so hence, maybe we'd like to have a commodity money and we start searching. The king commodity isn't gold. The king commodity is Bitcoin, but, let, but, but the conventional commodity is gold. So when you start thinking about trading a uh, billion dollars of gold for a billion dollars of fertilizer, the question becomes, a, how do you settle the gold? It's obscenely expensive to move it back and forth. B, it's not fast. How do I move it back and forth a hundred times a month? And then C, how do I avoid getting ripped off? Because you'll probably have it rehypothecated and inflated. And the history of gold, right? The fiction of gold is it's sound money. It's never been sound money. The history of gold is I can show you an incidence every decade for the last 4,000 years where some ruler cheated using gold, debased the gold, issued notes against the gold, issued IOUs on the gold, or defaulted on the gold. It didn't just happen under Nixon. It didn't just happen under Roosevelt. It, it's happened over and over again. And it will happen again because gold itself isn't suitable as a high-velocity money. It's, it's failed as high-velocity money for 150 years. So I think what will happen is the free market will will uh, scrounge around and experiment trying all sorts of barter arrangements, trying swap arrangements, uh, swapping the rupee for the ruble, swapping the CNY for some, you know, name your favorite African currency you want to swap for, don't know if there is one. And at some point, then they'll realize, well, you know, I didn't trust the dollar, but why do I trust the Chinese more, right? I'm just moving for one one currency system to another currency system. Some of them will try gold, some of them will try commodities. Gradually, people will discover Bitcoin and they'll, and they'll start to realize that the solution to the problem is Bitcoin because it is high velocity money, which is not corruptible. But that won't happen quickly. That will happen in a slow boil over the course of one, two, three decades. And I would say that the de-dollarification or the embracing of commodity money, it's an auspicious catalyst on the periphery. That now the unthinkable is now thinkable. It's now, it's, it's now clear that we have certain factions with money that are trying to figure out what they do in a world without the Western banking system. And they don't have a good answer yet. But what it starts is it starts a fire burning. It's a spark. Uh, the fire is going to burn brighter and brighter and brighter. And, and objective, um, objective traders 
that are in the middle are going to start to see the virtues of backing their financial instruments with Bitcoin or using Bitcoin directly, you know, uh, at some rate. I don't know what rate. But the de-dollarization trend, you agree, is accelerating and it's now planted the seed of moving away from the dollar. We, on, on the commodity side, we do have central banks buying gold at, at record levels. But ultimately, until a Bitcoin standard is reached, you're seeing that in as, as soon as you said uh, three decades? These are edge effects. They're happening on the edge. There's, there's incredible, extraordinary inertia in the Western world between Western Europe and the United States and all the banks that trade and all the institutions that trade and the dollar. And that inertia is going to continue to support that system for a long, long time. The right way to think of it is, is Bitcoin is about $500 billion of monetary value right now against $500 trillion of financial instruments that are somewhat liquid that have value. And so that makes it 10 basis points. And so what, what reasonably should happen is it will, on the edge, continue to, uh, to encroach and creep up and it'll go from being a tenth of a percent to half a percent to one percent to two percent to four percent to six percent to eight percent. But when Bitcoin is 10 million a coin, right, it still might not be 10, 15 percent. It will be one of a number of assets and it will gradually drain off monetary energy, but there will be other assets that all assets are in competition with each other. It's not just currencies. Bitcoin is, Bitcoin is in competition with gold. Bitcoin is in competition with your second Airbnb apartment that you buy in order to generate rents off it. It's in competition with commercial real estate, in competition with ETFs, bond funds, not just sovereign bonds. It's in competition with corporate debt and mortgage-backed securities and the like. And uh, all, of these, all of these assets are in competition as a store of value. And then you have all these currencies in competition with each other, the, the US dollar and the CNY and, and every other currency. As long as nation states exist, they'll have currency. And um, the assets will continue to compete. And then if you happen to be in that situation where you live in a country where you don't have a reliable currency if i lived in a if i lived in a war zone and the currency collapsed and i don't have an american bank in the war zone and the local bank is not trustworthy at that point i'll adopt bitcoin as my bank and i'll adopt bitcoin as my currency but that's because law and order broke down in that war zone for me as long as i live in china I'll use a Chinese bank and the Chinese currency. And when I live in the U.S., I'll use the U.S. banks and the U.S. currency. But you will see examples. You're seeing it right now. Uh, in Lebanon, they've abandoned the local currency and they're dollarizing because the banks failed, the currency failed. And people from Lebanon uh, will tell you that dollar is the currency. And in, um, in El Salvador, after their civil war, their currency failed, so they adopted the dollar. If people are able... To adopt a dollar, they may, but you can see right now with the with the clamp down on stable coins, uh, they may not they may have a hard time adopting the dollar. So the one thing that everybody can adopt is Bitcoin, and you're going to see this this chain reaction taking place everywhere in the world and continually burning and expanding with a dynamic equilibrium. Does that include central banks, though? I mean. At what point do you see central banks of countries that typically used to have uh, dollar reserves moving to Bitcoin? Is there a Bitcoin standard as we're seeing faith in the dollar ex uh, decline? Uh, I think if you look at um, sovereign wealth funds, Norway, Norwegian sovereign wealth fund, the Middle Eastern sovereign wealth funds, it used to be... 30 years ago, you always heard, quote unquote, central banks only hold treasuries. And then there was a point about a decade ago where you started hearing sovereign wealth funds own Apple stock. 
or they own Microsoft, or they owned S&P stocks or NASDAQ stocks or something. So they started actually embracing other forms of assets or real estate. I think that, um, that Bitcoin will first find its way into the sovereign wealth funds because they know how to invest in Apple. And if you're gonna hold Apple, uh, uh, if you're gonna hold the world's strongest mobile network, why wouldn't you hold the world's strongest digital monetary network? So I think you'll see it creep in that way. They're the most innovative, most, you know, most risk taking. I think the extremely bureaucratic, stable, uh, traditional central banks of the mega states, they'll be the last to embrace it. So I, I wouldn't look to them to do it until you first see it in the sovereign wealth funds and then you see it in the you see it in places like El Salvador, you see it in the smaller countries that have more to gain, less to lose. And, um, and, and before that happens, though, I think you'll see institutional investors and you'll see families and private companies and then public companies embrace Bitcoin. But the green light would be uh, sovereign wealth funds. We, we have uh, developments out of Liechtenstein with the prime minister there, who's also the country's finance minister, has said that they are accepting payments in Bitcoin and that they're very open to investing state reserves in Bitcoin in the future, admittedly a very small country, but there is a start. Um, with, with regards to currency, last time we spoke, you said, and you're consistent in that, um, that uh, the, the future of the world is 8 billion people with mobile wallets with a currency layer and an asset layer, and the currency is going to be the dollar and the euro or the Chinese yuan, and the asset layer is going to be Bitcoin. Does that vision hold? Yeah, I think we're still headed toward that. In terms of um, a potential looming threat on the currency side, we've got the idea of the central bank digital currency, which is, of course, a form of fiat issued by a country central bank, which allows the government to continue issuing at will to monitor every single transaction made, therefore obliterating completely freedom and anonymity and also potentially being able to program these currencies to work or not work to enact certain transactions. We're in Florida, where Governor DeSantis has signed a bill banning central bank digital currencies in the state. What are your thoughts on the possibility of a CBDC in, in the US and in other, shall we say, uh, other so-called freedom-loving countries? I think everybody, everybody in the Western sphere of influence agrees they want the dollar. I think everyone in the Chinese sphere of influence is going to want the CNY, the, Ch the Chinese currency. I think right now the only form of digital dollar circulating is cryptocurrency, like stable coin. And that represents one extreme, which is the dollar circulating non-KYC in a dark pool. The other extreme would be a CBDC, a dollar issued centrally by the government, controlled by the government, where they have transparency and control of every transaction. I think that politically, uh, the libertarians would like to see uh, the former. They'd like to see cryptocurrency circulating with zero control and oversight. I think that the authoritarians would probably like to see the latter. They'd like to see the currency circulating with complete government oversight. I think that in the political world, there's a lot of resistance to the CBDC. I don't think that we'll find a majority of politicians in either the Democratic or the Republican Party that will support uh, a complete CBDC. So I think that it's a non-starter on Capitol Hill. I think the Republicans would block it, but I think the Democrats would block it too. And I think that, I think uh, ultimately the banking establishment won't want it either because a CBDC would be an example of disintermediating all the banks, starting with the big banks down to all the banks, and then what, what is their business? So I think that, the, that there will be alarmists that will say, oh, the CBDC's coming, you know, get ready. I think that that will sell a lot of Bitcoin. I think a lot of people will go and they will buy Bitcoin and, and, there'll be, and you'll get a lot of campaign donations, right? But I think ultimately the political settlement will be uh, digital currency will come uh, not in the form of a stable coin. I think that they will eventually wind down because that's too much freedom. And the, the regulators are winding them down, like the Wells Notice to BUSD, like the Custodia Denial Letter, 
like uh, the move by the Canadian regulators to prevent you from trading stable coins on crypto exchange in Canada, like the denial of Tether in the US. So I think the regulators will move uh, to clamp down on any non-KYC digital dollars. I think that no one is putting forth any CBDC legislation right now that I can see. There's no credibility there or consensus. I think we'll go, we're probably headed toward less digital currency. Like right now there's $140 billion. At the peak, there were probably $160 billion of digital currency trading between Tether and Circle and other coins and UST. And I think we've already peaked and I think we're going toward less of that. And then at some point they will restart the digital currency initiative and it will be an FDIC insured bank approved by the by the Federal Reserve and the Treasury that they trust. And there will be a negotiated set of controls, like more than $10,000 will be reported and less than $10,000 will not be reported and the records will be held by the bank and not by the US government. And, it, and the libertarians won't like it, right? It won't make them happy, it's too much control. But at the, end of, at the end of the day, the authoritarians won't like it because it'll be too little control. But the United States has already shown that it's willing to actually use banks and bank wires to move money around and, and let JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs and Citigroup do whatever they're going to do. So a year ago, if I'd asked a bank like uh, Silvergate or Signature, are you going to issue a stable coin? They would have said there are a lot of regulatory problems with that. And uh, even today, if you went to any of these banks and said, can you issue a stable coin? They said, like, we don't see a path. Uh, so I think that we're in this kind of uh, this uh, whatever holding pattern where there isn't any path to registering a legitimate digital currency that will be acceptable to the regulators. But, and, and the existing stuff is not acceptable. So there's gonna to have to be a transition over the next 24 to 48 months. And eventually, and now I, I would say eventually we'll see trillions of dollars circulating on mobile phones that will be a digital currency and it will be something different, something in between what truly permissionless cryptocurrency is and then what the CBDC thing might be. Well, I, I get your point on stable coins and regulations and that uh, they may be too much political resistance for a central bank digital currency in the US. I mean, we, we have seen a number of Republicans already push back against it, but what happens if it takes off in in Europe? I mean, the ECB is pushing aggressively uh, for it. Uh, Rishi Sunak, uh, UK's prime minister, big fan of the CBDC, the Bank of England, um, putting together the rails for uh, a payment system similar to the Fed now payment system, which is regarded as potentially laying down the groundwork for a CBDC. If we're having uh, CBDCs implemented by other countries, and I, I believe 11 have officially launched in over 114 countries, according to the Atlantic Council, are developing a CBDC. If the political resistance in the US is too strong, but they do happen <clears throat> elsewhere, does the U.S. have to go along with that program? Can the U.S. not have a CBDC if, you, if other countries do, other G7 countries do? The digital currency of every country will reflect the politics of the country and the philosophy of the country. So in a place where there are no property rights, a Korea or a Cuba, they'll have completely overbearing implementations. In China, there'll probably be a very tight, transparent implementation because they're much more comfortable with that. And they're more author authoritarian. Um, every country in Europe has a different view. The point, uh, the point I would make there is there's an overwhelming demand for dollars, not euros. If you look at the, di if you look at the digital currency demand, people, uh, people would choose a digital dollar 97 or, or 98 to 1, 100 X as often as a digital euro, even though they look similar. Nobody wants the euro, they want the dollar. 
And if you read the custodia denial letter, the regulators made very clear that under no circumstance will they allow any bank in the world to issue a digital dollar that can circulate non-KYC. And, they, and that means no European country is going to issue a digital dollar. And of course, the conundrum is no European country has the power to issue the digital euro. The central bank of the EU is going to shut down Norway or Swe Sweden. Sorry, I'm going to get myself in trouble. I better make sure I pick countries that are on the, on the euro. They're not going to let any country that uses the euro issue a digital euro. And so there's going to be a massive political process in the EU parliament over the nature of that instrument. They will resolve it based upon what the European Union feels. It might be more authoritarian than the US. It will be irrelevant to the question of the digital dollar because the decision of what the digital dollar is, is going to be decided in DC. And I don't see either the Republicans or the Democrats endorsing a CBDC right now. So I can't speak to the future of the digital ruble or the digital CNY, right? I mean, ultimately, that's a local political situation. What I can say is the world wants dollars. It wants dollars 100x more than it wants any of these other currencies. The dollar is the world reserve currency. The decision will be made by financial regulators in the United States in, cons in, in a dialogue with uh, the legislators. So you're not necessarily seeing the U.S. being coerced into a CBDC if it's the trend uh, by, by other I, countries. I think the opposite. Like, like, certainly if the Chinese do it... Well, they have. They practically... The U.S. will do the opposite. So if the Chinese do implement a CBDC, that will probably be impetus for the U.S. not to do it because it will be, it will be so objectionable. So I think that the Chinese adopting a CBDC actually works against the consideration of the idea in the U.S. since it's proof that it's an authoritarian instrument. And I don't think that the EU or uh, the way that financial regulations work, if you consider securities law, commodities law, uh, and, and financial controls and banking controls, they normally flow from D.C. to Europe, to Singapore, to the Middle East, and to South America. They don't flow the other way. You can see, I think you can expect the Canadians, the Australians, those in Singapore, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Western Europeans to all take their cues from the United States, not the opposite way around. So the political battle will be for the most part fought on Capitol Hill and in DC. And if, if, if the United States adopts a certain expectation for banking or, or the like, or currency controls, typically uh, other countries will look at those and, and they'll be influenced very strongly. There's a lot of pressure to not go against the wind. And I, and I would say, if you're another country and you want to have tighter capital controls, they're okay with that uh, as long as it doesn't affect the dollar. Like, it's okay for the Argentines or the Chinese to have capital controls. But if any country implements a control that affects the dollar or affects the U.S. banking system, that's going to be a big problem. They'll get, their banks will get kicked off the network. And so I... So to the extent that anything is threatening to the, to the identity of the dollar, that becomes a, a strategic threat to the United States. It's either military or political, and you would probably get incredible pushback. So you're saying that the U.S. is going to continue to lead the way in terms of CBDC adoption or not because... Uh, it's, it's the leader, but at the same time, we've discussed the trend of de-dollarization where the U.S. is potentially losing its might when you're seeing the bifurcation of the global monetary system with the countries, as we discussed, wanting to do trade amongst each other, wanting to launch their own asset. Does the U.S. and does the dollar still have that, that might to sort of uh, lead the way and, and influence the adoption of a CBDC if politically it's seen as unfavorable in the U.S.? There's a competitive world and there's going to be continual competition uh, across all the various trading markets. So I, 
I think the Europeans will do some things that will affect the U.S. The Chinese will do some things that will impact the U.S. Things happen in the Middle East and South America that affect the U.S. Um, the U.S. will lead the way. We're moving toward a multipolar world where, where there are more other actors today probably than there were 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So the world's getting more complicated getting more multi-dimensional there's more uncertainty and there'll be more there will be more uh innovation in different parts of the world and more experimentation um and so i don't i don't this i, I don't yeah, doubt I'm, that i just don't think that there's a cbdc coming to the i am United very States happy to hear that michael that that right. reassures me tremendously i've been losing a lot of sleep over the potential of, of a cbdc and what that means in terms of curtailing freedom and liberty in terms of um can I, can I make a point on that yeah i look i i read thousands of pages of all the legal filings by the regulators and you know they have hearings in congress i don't read the headline on twitter i listen to every minute of the eight hours of the hearings i listen to every utterance of every congressperson and and every legislator and so I, the last thing I did is listen to nine hours of congressional hearings by the House Financial Services Committee. The first six hours grilling Gary Gensler on securities. The next three hours on stablecoin. There is one piece of legislation in Capitol Hill related to stablecoins. This is what it says. You're not allowed to issue algorithmic stablecoins like Do Kwon did. That's a bad thing. And then no one's allowed to issue a stable coin unless the Federal Reserve says you're allowed to issue it. But we don't know how that'll happen ever. And there's no time frame to do that. So in essence, they said, you can't do this thing and you can't do anything else. And there's no plan to be able to do anything else. That's what the bill says. Then the Congress people began, uh, went on to speak about it. The Democrats said, we don't agree with this bill. The Republicans talked about whether or not uh, you know, there should be a way to create a stable coin. No conclusion was made. There is no time frame to agree on a bipartisan bill. That meaning there is no way that there's, there's going to be an agreement uh, between the House and the Senate. There's no way there's going to be a bipartisan agreement. And there is no bill. There, I mean, there isn't even an idea to object to yet. And that's the most advanced piece of legislation with regard to digital assets. Everything else not even on the table. So there's no legitimate discussion anywhere in DC about doing anything concrete with regard to digital currencies, digital securities, digital tokens, or digital exchanges. We're waiting for someone to even make an objectionable proposal. And that's the status quo right now. And if you read the tea leaves, given the fact that, the, that Congress and the Senate are split, I don't. I, I think that this entire debate, you could probably assume, will be stalled until after the next presidential election, and when they seat the new Congress in the beginning of 2025, there will be leadership, and there might be a political balance of power that might allow you to worry about something. But right now, I really feel we're kind of paralyzed in the status quo, and I would assume a more regressive environment, which is the dismantling of things that exist in order to in order to return to um, conventional traditional techniques rather than the construction of anything new that's threatening to the status quo okay point taken i can sleep better about that gitco news special coverage of bitcoin 2023 is brought to you by coin payments crypto payments made easy